upon your word. O God, ah, Father Jehovah, a word that will bring life. Holy Spirit, please help us this morning. Help us this morning. Help us this morning. We need you like never before. Help us this morning. Holy Spirit, we need you like never before. Help us this morning and let your name alone be glorified. Blessed be your holy name. For in Jesus' precious name, we all have prayed. Amen. This morning, we will continue again our fellowship as we take him 87. Uh, him 87. Uh, from our hymn book, uh, it says, uh, <clears throat> And can it be that I should boast? Uh, how can it be that I should boast? And can it be that I should care? In 87, one, two, go. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me, who caused his pain for me, who him to death pursued. Ah, amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? Oh, amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die? Die for oh, I'm missing, I'm missing. My God should die for amazing, amazing love. How can it be you that thou, my God, should die for me? For no condemnation now I dread, Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine. Oh, bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ, my own. Oh, 
amazing love, oh, how can it be, oh, that thou, my God, should die for? Amazing, amazing love, oh, how can it be, oh, that thou, my own God, should die for one more time amazing love how can it be that thou, thou my God should die for me can we just go ahead and thank him Whatever we are today, whatever we will ever be, is what he, we are because of what he has made us. Can you just go ahead and thank him and say, Lord, I have nothing to boast. Lord, there is nothing to, for me to boast. And how can I gain? Why should I gain an interest in my Savior's blood? He died for me. I caused him pain, but he died for me. Brethren, we can never uh, stop thanking him for what he did on the cross of Calvary. If he didn't die for us, we would have been wretched sinners trying to help ourselves. But we thank him that he himself has had mercy on us. Can we just go ahead and just talk to the Lord again? I said, Lord, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for setting me free. Blessed be your holy name. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Praise the Lord. Uh, can we go ahead this morning and um, just uh, take some inputs uh, from the uh, world that God has um, helped us Again, uh, last class, um, if you were here uh, last class, and uh, by the grace of God, you joined us, uh, can we have some input? What was it that you left the class with? What was your take home? What were the issues that God spoke to you? Um, um, what were the issues that God spoke to you uh, that you were able to receive? Uh, so we'll take some inputs uh, before we proceed. Okay, I see the hand of our sister, Stabimbola. Uh, please go ahead. Good morning, class. Yeah, good morning. Go ahead. Yes, um, we give God the glory for another opportunity to be in today's class. Um, the summary of what I was able to take home from last week's um, study about who is a disciple. So we're able to see that the reason people are finding discipleship very difficult is actually because they are not born again. So a life exchange has not been done. And because that has not been done, all the training that discipleship is bringing, they are finding it very difficult because there is no way the flesh can do the activities of the spirit freely or easily because the life inside of them, who is the one that requires the training, has not been translated yet. So that is a very key issue that I held on to last week. You can't grow in discipleship if the life inside of you has not been exchanged. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Bimbola. Uh, if that life you can't you can't just make uh, you can't uh, train a lizard to be a crocodile. If that life inside has not been changed, no matter what you do, 
uh, that person will just keep struggling. Thank you very much. Every time I see, uh, sometimes pastors are trying to train a lizard to be a crocodile. It won't just work. Praise the Lord. Yes, Sister Esther, please go ahead. Good morning, class. Good morning. <clears throat> yeah, um, to portray what uh, Sister just said now, I'm going to start from there. I took so many things um, home last week by the grace of God. Um, we learned last week that, I mean, the topic was um, who, who is a disciple? And we noted, we noted that uh, a disciple is a person that, ha that has experienced two baths, natural baths and spiritual baths. A man, we only, you know, and we, we now see the difference between the, the, those that are, uh, are still going, you know, that are still carrying only one life, which is natural life, uh, they came with from their mother's womb, that it is not possible for people like that to, you know, to obey God. We learned that um, people like, 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 you know, people with only one life, the natural life, they are still carrying that la natural life. They are the people with stony hearts, as our sister just mentioned, that these are, the, they might be in the church, even for, for so many years, they might even be geo, they might even be whatsoever, like we see in the life of, uh, of, uh, of Nicodemus, who was, uh, um, uh, what's it called, Pharisees, and still came at night to meet Jesus Christ, to, you know, to find out about this. And we thank God that people like that came out, and that's what we are, we are enjoying today, that question, I mean, how he came to Jesus Christ, and we saw how Jesus Christ came clear to him. He did not deceive. He did not look at him because he's a, he's, he, 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 uh, he's a, a Pharisee. He's a teacher, I mean, or whoever. He didn't look at him with that. He didn't weigh his life with that. But he just came straight to him. And he told him that unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So a born again or a disciple will be someone who, are, who has experienced two parts. The second part, which is um, uh, born again, we are talking about that with water, you are born by water and spirit. And as I was pondering on this during the week, uh, God actually, you know, he, he, he brought it very easy. He brought it to me in a very clear way. It's like, I mean, the way he, he dropped it in my heart was just like, he said, look, the word of God is like a material, the raw material. Then the Holy Spirit, we breath into that. We, 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 um, we put, and uh, is the one that we empower that word. And the, that word is like a processing that is only the people that carry the life of Christ, that this, the spirit of God is inside of them to process even the word of God. So the word of God, even if we are born again and the word of God is absent, <laughs> there is no, there will be no growth, not, not at all. And it, it, will, it will be like empty vessel. So there is nothing Holy Spirit will work on. So the word of God is where we can't separate the two. The word of God and the spirit of God, they walk together. Praise the Lord. And we realize again in the same area that the, 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 the born again we are saying is that having the spirit of God inside of you. And who give that? Um, um, Ezekiel 36 to, uh, 26 to 27 made us understand that God is the one that does it. Is the one that gives, that removes the stony heart that we were born with, and then even in putting the heart of flesh in us, the heart of Christ, the heart that can listen to God, the heart that understands the word of God, the heart that obeys, 
the heart that's humble, it's God that gave it there. The pastor doesn't give it because that's the problem that the, the church is having even today. When you look at a, a man like yourself and you think that he can, he can give you what man has no power to give is God because in that passage he's telling us, I will give you, I will remove, you know, that's God. God was speaking there. And we, 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 we learned that last week that is only God that gives the heart, that removes the heart of stone, uh, of stone and give the heart of, of flesh that can walk with God, that can obey God. So there are so many things, but we just, I bless God for what God is doing, you know, how God is breaking it down, even for me on this platform. And I've realized that for me to get, uh, to get everything that God have for me, the first thing is to humble myself and to ask for the spirit, to the spirit of God to help me even to, you know, to, 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 to help me in, in, in abiding with the word. And I can come here and just get up, not doing anything again. So it's, 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 I'm learning how to sit down because if the word of God is the material that the Holy Spirit will use inside of me to transform my life, to do everything that we do, it will not just do anything with empty, you know, it will not just work on emptiness. He need the word of God to work on my life and to, to, to make me grow. And finally, we learned that natural man cannot grow in the spirit because goat is not the same with sheep. So if we are going for so many activities, we are, uh, and you are not born again, and you are, you are going through here and there, this meeting, that meeting and all that, you are, you know, you are everywhere and your heart is not born again, and you have not born again, you cannot grow in spirit. You can, you can only grow in, 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 in naturally, which can, we can see that is that someone is deteriorating the life of someone. We might look at it as it's life that is, is, is bubbling, but it's not. It's not actually bubbling. So born again, we see it last week that it is, it, is, it is the beginning of the journey, of our journey in Christianity. So, and I will just stop there. I will stop there. Thank you, God. Um, bless you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you very much. Uh, so you can see that that's the issue of the entrance is very critical to anything, whether it's a university or the secondary school, the entrance qualification is what determines how strong uh, that person will become. Uh, may the Lord help us uh, that we will not just be, uh, we will not be casual with this issue. And um, each one of us must keep going back to check and recheck that my boom bone again is not a certificate I have hanged on the shelf. It is actually a reality, Con current, status that i'm currently uh you know in that state of being born again praise god okay let me go to sister tayo shuku satayo please go ahead praise the lord hallelujah okay Sorry, um, I just want to thank God that we, you give us the opportunity to also have the recordings whereby we can go back to sit with what we did on the platform. Um, just to add to what my sisters have said, one of the things that struck me was the matter of there not being a lateral conversion. So no matter who I am in the world, when I'm coming, if I want to come to Jesus, there is an entry point. It's still this matter of being born again. And I saw that um, you explained it. The Holy Spirit helped you to explain to us very much about the fact that as I grew to look like my father and my mother in the natural, 
the same way, the same process that I need to go through as a baby, like when a child was born, you said I can only be celebrating a birthday, I can only be looking at all day because I was born. So the same way, if I want to look at the life of becoming like Jesus, it was emphasized so much last week that our first goal, our first assignment, it's not first of all, or oh, what I want to do, but it's to become like Jesus. And so there's no lateral conversion. Jesus did not hide this fact from Nicodemus. He came very, very straight, very, very strong, and very, very clear explanation to Nicodemus that no matter what you are, where you are coming from as head of Pharisee or whatever you are in the Sanhedrin, for you to first of all see, and I saw again the matter of the first of all seeing before entry that you must be born again, born of the water and of the spirit. And I also thank God that, you know, we have opportunity to ask questions. And in somebody asking questions, another matter is opened up unto me. Our sister asked on the matter of water baptism and, the, and you know, whether I was the same. And you made it very clear that water baptism is just an, a symbol, is an expression of what has happened inside. It's not, first of all, the externality. I also saw that. And I also saw the fact of the matter of being born again it was the change of ownership. You use the, the analogy of a company take, going through a takeover. You talked about, I think, Chevron and another company that a, a company is taking over that. It's the ownership that has changed. You can still be seeing the same logo. If over time, the logo may change to the new owner, but it was first of all to bring home to me the matter of, has there been a change of ownership in my own life? You looked at a, a woman getting married who likes Amala, and then you get married to this man who loves something else that because there's a change of ownership that came very strong to me that the things I do in my life, is it, ex, is it exhibiting the fact that there's been a change of ownership, my change of career, my, my outward, even my dressing, does it show that Jesus is Lord and Savior, is the owner, is the one who dictates what I do now. Again, like, you know, like our sister said, there was so much I took away. But that matter of lateral conversion and, you know, the, the encouragement for us that even as Christians now, I should not deceive somebody. Jesus did not deceive Nicodemus. He broke it down in clear terms, in language equal, and he used things that will understand about a, a, a child being born. And we saw that the word again actually means God is giving me the, the, the matter of being born again as again born again, again, something that is, 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 is a, is a asset, it's something that will benefit me in the long run. My being born again is not, it's not first of all God that will benefit, it's me. And it is the goal of it is to become like Jesus. The goal of it is not first of all, the assignment that I want to do, but is to become like Jesus. And to do that, it is only God that can do it. And you went on to explain that again in that matter of the Ezekiel chapter that we read, that I will, you emphasize a lot on the word, I will. It is God who can do it. Nobody can do it for me. Praise the Lord. Thank you very much uh, for all these inputs. I'm sure for those who were not able to come, uh, you will have been able to catch up. Okay, we'll take the last hand from uh, Hillary. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, three things for me. And um, the first one is the hymns. Um, I want to thank God for the grace of choosing the right hymn for each of the sessions. Uh, the hymn of uh, three Tuesdays ago it has become a very common hymn in our house. The children have learned it. And so thank you for being uh, used of God to pick uh, what him we're using in our classes. That that they just keep up the good spirit. Don't uh, don't stop. It's blessing us here. And then secondly, I took away the fact that um, water baptism is only an outward expression of an inward change. We must not put the card before the horse. We must not reverse it. You know, today people are not even born again. I mean, they already baptize them so that they can collect tithe 
Sometimes they are not even born again, tight are collected. Sometimes they want to quickly baptize them so that they have a baptismal tight card. No. If there is no inward change, the outward expression is useless. There's no difference between that and those who do um, children water baptism. So we must ensure that, that there is an inward change which is born again, and that the water baptism can now be an outward, uh, outward sign. In addition to what um, our sisters have all shared, I think I'm the only brother sharing now. Um, I, I went home meditating again over the issue of Nicodemus and the Lord Jesus. And I, I got so affected with the attitude and approach of Nicodemus when he came to Jesus. Not just that he came by night, you know, I went back checking because this is pastor's class, you know, and I want to be like the Berean brethren. I went back checking, but why was Jesus this? Why did he spend 22 verses? You know, I saw in my Bible from verse 3 all the way down to verse 20, 21. Jesus was just, he spent the whole night talking with this man of God. I was wondering if I can sacrifice like that. And why was Jesus sacrificing such time with the man? I saw that the man came with a different motive. The man did not come to be born again. His intention of coming in verse 2. The Bible says he came to Jesus by night and he said to him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher. You come from God. For no man can do these miracles that you do except God be with him. You see the angle he was coming. The Lord was showing me that, look, Nicodemus was not coming to be born again. He came looking for miracles. He came to know um, how the miracles that Jesus was performing, how they were coming. You know, and he was not coming for himself. He said, we know thou art a teacher. Sometimes we can come to a class like this and we're not coming for ourselves. We can just become like Nicodemus. Sometimes we come to get notes and yes, on how to prepare our sermon. As pastors, we look for messages to go and bamboozle our congregations and all of that. It looks like that was the kind of entry Nicodemus was coming to Jesus. You know, he said, we know that was a teacher. Wonderful. I mean, what? And look at the way he came. He came, you know, you know, at the top class, at the level, you know, he came regarding Jesus at a high level, that was a teacher. You know, no man can do these things except God be, you know, was looking as if he's asking for the presence of God, miracles, anointing. That, that is the trend of the present day church now. You see people falling under anointing, miracles here and there. That, that, was, that was the kind of preacher he was. And he needed something that would authenticate his ministry visibly for men to see. And what struck me was that it took maturity in verse 3 for Jesus to sell to him verily, verily. I thought that when you say, oh, thou a teacher coming from God, no man can do these miracles except God be with him. Many people rejected what Jesus was preaching. I thought Jesus would get up and shake him and say, oh, wow, thank you. Ah, okay, Nicodemus, at least you have appreciated my effort. Look at the Sandri, the scribe. They don't know me interested in what I'm doing for you to come like this, take a high table and sit down. I thought Jesus should have responded because that should be the response. If somebody say, oh, God is with me. You are doing miracles. You are a teacher. Uh -uh. I should, I should, uh -uh. I should be very civil and then, but Jesus looked at him and said, verily, verily, I said to you, you know, the Holy Spirit was telling me that, can I be this bold? Can I be this bold as Jesus stood here? That a very, very great man like that will come around and he's looking for miracle. And I'm saying, no, no miracle first. You must be born again. Today we are missing the mark. And I think that's why this teaching is coming. That as pastors, we must not be carried by miracles, carried by anointing, carried by people falling down. Born again is far more important than people who are receiving miracles and they are not changed. What is the use of all of this going on in the corridor of the church when there's no inward change? I think the Holy Spirit was dealing with me on that, that I need to settle down and be as bold as Jesus was here to confront everyone that is not born again, but is looking for the good deeds, the good things, with long probes to, you know, to serve the things that are in God without an inward change. I think this was um, a very strong issue that came to my mind to confront every Nicodemus with the true gospel. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Hillary, particularly for raising that last matter. Um, 
that what is the use of trying to uh, heal somebody and that person has not yet experienced salvation? Uh, you know, we are saying somebody has leprosy. You, you are saying the person, he has itching. His body is itching him. That's, that's, there's no comparison. And I wish and I pray that as the body of Christ, we will put priority on what we call essential, core causes. You saw that when it came to being born again, Jesus said, unless. When it came to the issue of being born again, he will put use word unless, except. These are, con these are issues that you cannot do without. A man can go to heaven being crippled. We saw that uh, uh, Lazarus, uh, and we saw the story of Lazarus, a man who was uh, sitting at the floor, sitting, you know, getting cr uh, crumbs from the, from the table. But we saw that uh, when it was time for eternity, he was on the other side. But when a man is not saved, when a man is not born again, there's nothing you give him that honestly you have given him anything. So if God gives me money and I'm still a sinner, I'm a rich sinner, I'm a healthy sinner, and whatever your son name is, that's your location. So if I'm a rich sinner, I will end up in hell. If I'm a healthy sinner, I will end up in hell. If I'm a married sinner, I will end up in hell. If I'm a, a, a CEO sinner, I will end up in hell. So anything that comes before your son name uh, doesn't matter because it is your son name that actually gives the direction. That's what tells us what tribe you are from. And so somebody can be Chinedu, Tokwa. We, if his son name is Tokwa, we know he's an Igbo, he's a Yoruba man, even though his name is Chinedu. So if you are a healthy man, you are healthy, you are rich, you are comfortable, but at the end, your surname is sinner. You will still go to hell. And I pray that uh, we, will not, we will not take this for granted so that people will not be in hell and be calling your name. You know, I think it was in the MLR, uh, MLR that uh, I think was Bolaria, one of the mission outreaches. And uh, the brother was saying, how terrible will it be when you get to heaven and people are calling your name and they are calling your name and say, boy, you didn't tell me. And they are calling your name from hell. And he said, you can imagine the level of disturbance that that will have been for you. That you can imagine the level of disturbance when somebody is you know, going through such a thing. And the honest truth is that um, he, is, um, he, is, he is going through such such things, but he's, there's nothing about him. Uh, he's just a sinner. Uh, that will not be our portion in the name of the Lord Jesus. Okay, so let's go to our, our, our study for today. Um, we have started looking at that. And so now we will be uh, pressing on a bit uh, to the matter of taking that yoke. Uh, we'll be taking that yoke. We had looked at the first condition which is to be born again. Uh, to be born again is our first condition. Uh, we had noted that uh, that's the first condition to be a disciple. Uh, so now we want to again go back and deal with this issue of taking his yoke. In Matthew chapter 11, uh, uh, we want to take his yoke. Matthew chapter 11. Uh, 29 and 30. So if you have it, you can read for us uh, from, uh, you know, a simple uh, in James first, and then we can take any simpler translation. We'll take King right. James first. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I have New King James. I can change okay. it to King James anyway. Please go ahead. Okay. I can I read it in King, uh, New King James version? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Take my, okay, Matthew 11, 29 to 30. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest, rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my, and my burden is light. Mm. Praise God. Hallelujah. 
Okay. Uh, can we take it from any other translation that we have? Matthew eleven twenty nine. Yes, any other person? Good news, living Bible. Okay. Um, I'm trying to open good news, sir. Okay. Um, Matthew 11, 29 and 30. Yeah. Okay. And it reads, my uh, okay. Take my yoke and put it on you and learn from me because I am gentle and humble in spirit and you will find rest. 30, for the yoke I will give you is easy and the load I will put on you is light. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now, if I, if I take it from the New Living Translation, it says, um, take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your soul. But that in says, for my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. The burden I give to you is light. Now, you will notice that um, verse 28, okay. Stataya, you wanted to read something? I've got the living Bible. Okay, okay, go ahead. Okay, 29.30. Wear my yoke, for hmm. it fits perfectly. Wonderful. And let me teach you, for I am gentle and humble, and you shall find rest for your souls, for I give you only light burdens. I yes. give you only light burdens. I give you only light burdens. Okay, our brother has brought... Um, the Passion Translation, it says, simply join your life with mine. Learn my ways, and you will discover that I'm gentle, humble, easy to please. You will find refreshment and rest in me. For all that I require of you will be pleasant and easy to bear. All that I'm going to require of you will be pleasant, will be easy to bear. I will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. I will not allow you to be harassed. I will not give you a burden bigger than you. No, I will give you what you can bear. It's going to be pleasant and it is going to be easy to bear. Now, do you know that actually, uh, verse 28, why we didn't start from 28? Because you see, 28 was talking about being born again. 28, uh, Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 was actually talking about being born again. While verses 29 and 30, we are talking about discipleship. So in 28, he said, come unto me, all of you that, are, uh, that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Note again that he is the one that will give you rest. He says, I will give you a new heart. Your own is to come. And you know, when he talks about coming, he talks about a man who has voluntarily uh, decided to change his direction. And we're talking about repentance. You know, when I say come, a man who is walking away, I said, come to me. It means he has to stop. He will turn and start walking towards my direction. It means that I'm now the one in control. When I say, come, come to me. I am now the one dictating your direction. I'm the one dictating your, uh, your pattern. I'm the one dictating what you are doing. I say, come to me. And you can imagine if somebody says, eh, I'm, I'm coming. Well, let me finish what I'm doing. Aha. You see, anything short of coming, you have not come. If you say, I'm coming, you have not come. And so even though Jesus was, has been saying to several people, come to me, 
They said, Jesus, we are coming. Allow my children to grow. This business is if I come now, I will not be able to do X, Y, Z. Lord Jesus, I am coming. And Jesus is saying, no, if you have not come, you have not come. And so for being born again, he says, come unto me, all of you that labor and are heavy laden and overburdened. You know, sin is a burden. And you see, you will never appreciate verse 30 if you have not under appreciated verse 28. If you do not understand the labor, you know, for some of us who are driving, uh, for some who are driving, you started driving manual, uh, sorry, automatic cars, you will not really appreciate an automatic car. But if you are driving a manual car and now you are giving an automatic car to drive, you will appreciate the difference. I started driving a manual car. And when I moved to an automatic, it was as if I was doing nothing. It was as if I was sleeping. Because it was too easy. Your, one of your legs is practically doing nothing. You can't afford that with a manual car. Your hand is on the gear. The other hand is, uh, one leg is on the clutch. One leg is on the accelerator or brake. And so you are, you know, you clutch and break, you clutch, you accelerate, you are, you are caught, your hand, your two legs are walking. So one hand, you know, you are, you are changing gear, you are holding steering, you are changing the, you know, so if you have never, if you have, if you've seen the labor, particularly if you drove a car that was not a power steering, now you are giving a car which is automatic, power steering, you will understand that this burden is light. If you have driven that hard manual, or I had given you a trailer to drive, <laughs> and you now are given a small sports car to drive, you know, if, when you are, those, that manual, that uh, steering that was not power steering, you know, you have to turn it, turn it, turn it, before it will answer you. But now you have a power steering, you just turn it slightly, it responds to you. So Jesus was saying, when you were serving sin, at the time you were serving sin, your body was heavy. Sin was heavy body. Any man that is carrying sin is carrying a heavy body. Your conscience is beating you. You know you are suffering, but you have no control. You don't like what you are doing, but you can't stop it. You are carrying a heavy body. If you have been relieved of that body, whatever Jesus will be giving to you will be light. If you truly have appreciated what the heavy body that was lifted off your head, honestly, whatever Jesus was to ask you to do, he will have asked you to do nothing. It will be very light. Very, very light. So I am noting that one of the reasons why a lot of Christians see the yoke of Jesus as heavy was because they never appreciated they never really appreciated what he did, the yoke he removed. That's why when Paul, a man like Paul, who appreciated the burden of sin that was lifted up from him, he said shipwreck is light affliction. He said stoning was light affliction. He said, beatings, imprisonment, he called all of them light affliction. Why? Because he said, you don't understand. <laughs> if I am beating and I'm on the right path, it's a good beating. But can you imagine being tormented in your spirit and you knew you couldn't help yourself? Paul said, that's my state. He said, I was the chief of sinners. I mean like this. I was the chief of sinners. I imprisoned God's people. 
I blood was in my hand. I was the chief of sinner. But God showed me mercy. And if God has shown a man mercy, ah, he will appreciate it. He will appreciate it. If you have been, if you used to use firewood to cook, if you used to go to the bush to cut firewood, to cut wood and set fire on it, and you know how smoke enters your eyes, how you, you all are crying just to set the fire. And the day that as you are trying to set the fire, rain now beats the wood. You see how frustrating it is. And now somebody takes your firewood away and gives you a gas cooker. You just light it, generally, and everything is working. You will appreciate a gas cooker. But you see, if you never had a firewood, if you never had firewood, and they gave you a gas cooker, you won't appreciate it. You won't appreciate it. So the Bible says that to whom much is given, much is required. And he that is forgiven much, ah, he will be grateful. Many times we are not grateful because you fail to remember where you were before Jesus saved you. For some of us, if Jesus had not saved you, you'll have been married with two wives. Your marriage will have ended. You'll have been a divorcee. If it was not for the word of God that intervened, you will have probably gone to a club, got drunk, and killed yourself driving. If you don't remember where he picked you from, you will always complain that the load he's giving you is heavy. But he said, the, the load I'm giving you is light. However, there is no following Jesus without carrying a load. No man is saved to live for himself. No man is saved to live for himself. You are saved when he saved you was so that you will no longer carry the load of the devil. But now you will start carrying his own load. Many Christians don't want to carry the load of the devil and they don't want to carry the load of Christ. They want to carry on their heads loadless. It won't work. No man lives for himself. So because you don't live for yourself, you, your head cannot be without a load. If the load of Christ is not on you, the load of the devil will come on you. You can't be loadless. So he said, take my yoke. Take it. And you see, when he says take, it is voluntary. You have a right to reject. So can you note that even though a man has come to Jesus in Matthew 20, 11, 28. You have come and he says, come unto me, all of you who are carry, weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Do you know that even if after Jesus has given a man rest from blindness, rest from sin, rest from sickness, rest from poverty, rest from whatever, that is not automatic discipleship. You see, actually, if it was automatic, he would not be asking you to take it. You would have just been saying, uh, now that the yoke is on you. Uh -uh. For the Lord Jesus, he does not mix the two together. Miracles that a sinner came to receive does not mean he is saved. Does not mean he, and that the fact that he came and said, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, many things push a sinner running. For example, a man who has not been able to sleep for one week. If you tell him to give his life to Christ, will he not give his life to Christ? If that's the condition for him to sleep, he will give his life to Christ so that he can sleep. But when he has now slept and he has enjoyed his sleep, then Jesus comes to him and say, brother, you have received rest so that you can sleep. But there is another rest on offer. It is called rest for your soul. 
You can have internal and external rest. I gave you external rest. External rest from poverty, external rest from worries, external rest from oppression, external rest from demons pressing you in the night. I gave you that rest. There is one more, which is the real one. What I gave you is an appetizer. If you take my youth, if you allow yourself to be joined to me, Jesus now said that if that happens, you will not just have found rest, you will now have rest even for your soul. Your soul will enter rest. Ted John says, Below, I wish above all that you prosper. External rest as your soul prospereth. Internal rest. A man that has external rest, no internal rest, has received nothing. Because external rest, you know, I, can't, I don't know how to explain this. Can you imagine that you took your car to car wash? The inner part of the car is dirty. The outside part of the car is dirty. And the car wash only washed outside. They didn't touch the inner dirty car. Please, how long does it take your external to be dirty? It only takes you to leave the car wash and for rain to begin to fall on a muddy path and the external will get dirty before you get home. But if you, a man has found a, the inside is clean, oh, you discover that for weeks, anyone who enters your car will appreciate the neatness inside. So when a car is not clean inside and is only clean outside, that external cleanliness does not last. So if a man prospers outside, but there is no prosperity of his soul, that man is not prosperous at all. He only has a, a mistakenly touched at rest. He will soon be troubled. That's why several people when they are not married, they come to Christ crying, oh, Jesus, Jesus. And you know, one pastor will say to them, oh, if you want this cost to be lifted, if you want this uh, 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 cost to be lifted from you, you know, you need to give your life to Christ so that this ancestral cost that is not allowing you to marry. And so they, they say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. They will pray all kinds of prayer. Then they get married. Aha. And they say, yes. I have now found rest. But however, it only takes two years if she's not pregnant. She's back to a state of restlessness again. <laughs> so you see, the rest she got to be married was temporary. The rest to enjoy the marriage is a different one. The rest to have her children is different. The rest to the children to be okay is different. So the external rest is a continuous pursuit, endless pursuit. Because human needs are in such a Where a man will find genuine rest is inside. Where he has found rest for his soul. My prayer is that you will take his yoke. He says, he says, take it, take my yoke. That take my yoke is willing. You are the one to willingly take it. And if you say, I will not take, he can't force it on you. The yoke of discipleship can never be forced on any man. You take it willingly. Jesus is stretching for his hands and saying, brother, take my yoke. The choice is yours. Whether you will say, yes, I will take it. Or you will say, no, I will never take it. Take my yoke upon you. Then he said, learn of me. You see, discipleship, is a process of learning. You must, you must accept to learn. You know, a disciple, Matatias, is a learner, is a pupil, a learner, one who understudies a master. Take my yoke, learn of me. He says, for I am meek. <laughs> you want to understand when Jesus says I'm meek, the former master we were serving, <laughs> he was not meek, he was harsh. Everyone who has served the devil will tell you that the devil is harsh. 
He's a harsh master. Jesus said, I am not like your former master. I am meek. I am lonely in heart. I am humble. I'm not a bossy master. I'm not a master you cannot discuss with. I'm not a master we cannot, we cannot talk about. We can dialogue matters. I am not a, a, a master that is, even though I'm the Lord, I am yet humble. He says, I'm humble in heart. He says, you will find rest. You will find relief and ease and refreshment and recreation. And you will, be, you will have blessed quietness for your soul. Discipleship is that point of soul transformation. That's why Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 was talking about you know, uh, 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 that, that we, we will be renewed, transformed in the renewing of your heart, your mind. It is the discipleship targets the renewing of your mind. And that every man must be converted to, there is one conversion. There is a conversion converted from being a sinner to being a saint. There's another conversion that takes place where a man's heart is being renewed. You see, the devil did two things to us. One is that he injected us with the virus of sin. Number two, he reprogrammed us. He reprogrammed us to operate against God. So even when the virus of sin has been uh, uh, removed, actually, there is a reprogramming that must take place. If you remember the story of Lazarus, Jesus said to Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus had life, but Lazarus was bound. He had life. He was alive, but was bound. And that's the state of many Christians. They're giving their lives to Christ. They are alive, but bound. They are bound by their theology. They are bound by the, their mentality. They are bound by their old way of doing things. They are bound by their behaviors. They are bound by many things. So they are Christians, but they are bound by their tribal sentiments. They are Christians but they are bound by their ideologies. They are bound by their upbringings. They are bound by their philosophies. They are bound by many things. What does discipleship do? Discipleship, you see, when a man is bound, he can't free himself. Okay. Somebody has to come who is free to free you. And on, 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 on you know, and on tie the rope that was tying your hand. Untie the rope that was tying your leg. Untie the rope because somebody has to help you. That's what discipleship does. Jesus said to Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus came forth alive. He was okay. He was alive. However, he was bound. So many Christians are born again. They're giving their life to Christ. They are alive. Their spirit man is alive, but their minds are bound. Their minds are still bound by the philosophies of this world. They still think riches by the definitions of this world. They think pleasure by the definitions of this world. Their minds have not been renewed. It is only when a man's mind has been renewed that that man begins to think like Christ. Be renewed in the renewing of your mind. Be renewed in sight. Be renewed in the renewing of your mind. So that you no longer think. You no longer think like the world thinks. You don't do things again the way the world does its things. You begin to do things the way Christ does things. And that must become our that must become our saving grace. If you don't, if you don't get to that kind of understanding, then you will discover that you will just be a waste. 
God must do something in your inner man. The inner man must be renewed. Uh, the inner man must be renewed. He says, I appeal to you. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and I beg of you, in view of all the mercies of God, to make a decisive dedication of your bodies, presenting all your members and faculty as a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, consecrated, and well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable sacrifice, rational, intelligent service, and spiritual worship. Then verse 2 says, do not be conformed to this world, uh, to this world, uh, to this world, this age, fashioned after, adapted to its external, superficial customs, but be transformed, changed by the entire renewing of your mind, by uh, by its new ideals and its new attitude, so that you may pro prove for yourselves that uh, what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God, even the things which is good and acceptable and perfect in his sight for you. Beloved, if you don't stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, if you don't stop it, even though a man is in the spirit, your spirit is born again, you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you don't stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, you will still be bound. Too many Christians are bound by the philosophies of this world. They are bound by the ideals of this world. They are bound by the opinions of social media. But I'm saying that you can't afford your life to be bound I pray that you will find liberty. I pray that you will enter liberty. You will find liberty for your soul. That even when a man is born again, he must gravitate to the next stage. He must be unloosed. He must be free. And like I said, someone else helps you to do this process. Because when a man is bound, he can't free himself. He needs somebody to free him. Do you have somebody who is helping you to unbound those ideals, those opinions, those cultures that you have modeled your mind with? Do you have somebody who is helping you to tie them? Can you imagine when a man is tied, your hands are tied behind you, your mouth is filled? How long will it take to free yourself? And so several Christians are struggling. I say, I will free myself. I will free myself. I will free myself. And you try to do that for six years. When somebody can help you free you in 10 minutes. In 10 minutes, if you give him your hands, he will untie you. He will remove it. You can talk. He will remove the thing that covered your face so that you can see in 10 minutes what you have been struggling for the last one year, trying to free yourself. Will you submit yourself to the process of being free? Will you submit yourself to the hand of one who wants to free you from the, from the ideals and opinions of the culture that is around you? Do you know that many of the reasons we are not growing as Christians is that we are still tied to our cultural beliefs? Those things you grew up with, how can you imagine a Christian who is born again saying that he cannot, he's Yoruba, he cannot marry an Igbo person? Can you imagine that? What, what, you, it just shows me that even though he's born again, he's still bound by the cultures around him. When the Bible says they're in Christ, there is no Greek, there is no Jew. All that matters is Christ. The other day, a sister was telling me, she said, I cannot give an evil man my house. I say, I, I. how do you live your life according to, uh, how do you live your life according to the desires of the flesh? I say, it can't work. 
You can't live your life like that. When a man is in Christ, he says, we know no man henceforth after the flesh. That's what we read in the scriptures. Henceforth, we know no man after the flesh. How can you still be knowing a man after the flesh? How? If not that you are still bound by, you are still bound uh, by your, the cultures that are around you. You are still bound by the ideals and opinions of people around you. You say, my people. When you say, my people, I usually will ask them, who are your people? Are your people the people uh, of where you were born from? Or are your people the people who are saved by the blood of Jesus? Who are your people? Are your people those who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus or those who attend your denomination? Who are your people? If not that you are still bound by the ideals and opinions of the cultures around you. So discipleship is that that gives you the second leg that allows you to be able to move in to that which God has prepared for you. Okay. Um, this morning, I have, uh, I'm sure, deviated so far. Uh, but let me wait and hear um, if you have any input uh, from all that we have uh, said so far. Any question? Uh, if you have a question or a contribution, uh, just please raise your hand uh, so we can take you. Okay. Uh, Sister Bimbola, go ahead. Yeah, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We are seeing that the reason we are suffering mm. physically mm. and spiritually is because we have not yoked or accepted the yoke that Jesus Christ is presenting to us. Mm. And Jesus Christ is saying, it is also a yoke, but this yoke that I'm presenting to you is very, very easy. I am not a tax master. I am not a wicked man, but whatever thing I am introducing to you, it will eventually give you rest. It will make you have peace of mind, both here on earth and when you even get to heaven. So I see this as the love of God to want to help everyone that knows that indeed sin has put a burden upon their head in terms of challenges, in terms of culture, in terms of expectations, in terms of look at all what your mates are doing, look at what they have achieved. Jesus Christ is saying, you come to me. You have no business with the world system again because what is born of the spirit is spirit and what is born of the flesh is flesh. Come to me and receive your rest. So I thank God for this once again this morning. Thank you very much, uh, Sabimbola. Yes, do we have any other question, comment uh, before we go ahead and read more? Um, anyone wanting to um, if not, I'll just go back and um, ask someone to read the commentary that when he says, take my yoke. I just wanted us to know that. Uh, go ahead, sir. Yes. Um, I am so challenged with the issue of the yoke and the way the Lord is bringing it this morning. Uh, as we are speaking, my mind skipped to Lamentation 3 verse 27 that it is good this yoke it is good uh, to bear it when you are still young mm. and today we are younger than we are going to be tomorrow um, the yoke is it has faces there is a face when you want to bear the yoke uh, it looks as if it will not be too good but the bible prescribed that it is good for a man to bear this yoke that has been described to us when we are still young, when we are still able to bear it, you know. And I think it was Isaiah 10, 27, he said, by the reason of anointing, every yoke shall be broken. So it means that somehow we're meant to carry a load. Um, but in Christ Jesus, he has reduced it. He has made it possible for us to carry it. But at what time also, 
we carry that yoke is important. If we carry it today, it's far more better than postponing to carry it next tomorrow. It is good for the man to bear the yoke when he's still young. Thank you. Thank you very much for that input. My brother is saying it is good uh, to take this yoke when you are young. <laughs> uh, uh, so that you don't take, try to carry this yoke uh, when you are old. Then it becomes heavy. Then it's, 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 it's now. Uh, now, you know, the Bible, there's a scripture that was saying that if you hear the voice of the Lord today, today is the day that you are to respond to it. Take this yoke now, because a time will come when you will be trying to take a yoke and it will not be easy again. Uh, you know, there was a time God had come to Samson. And Samson in, in the young day was to carry the yoke very light. The anointing on Samson was very light. But Samson, when he had misused and abused and had battered himself and had gone up down, up down in rebellion, at the end of the day, when he wanted to finish the work God had given him, he had to die along with the Philistines. The Philistines he was supposed to eradicate and then go and continue to rule over his people. He died with the Philistines. Can you take this you? Can you take it? Jesus is saying, take my you. My yoke is easy. My body is light. Take it. And some of us, the devil has blackmailed us. And he said, uh, if you take the yoke of Christ too early, you will become nothing. Wait until you have made your money before you take the yoke of Christ. Wait until you have achieved what you want to achieve. Then you come and take the yoke of Christ. It doesn't work. He says, take it now that you are still young. The Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. Okay, let's read a bit from the commentary uh, that is there. Uh, can, we, can somebody read for us uh, the commentary? If not, I can read from here. Having had rest from yeah. sin, having had rest from sin and the devil, mm. the disciple voluntarily, voluntarily yields his neck under the yoke of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, I want you to so, unpack. I want you to first move that word voluntarily. You see, discipleship can never be done if it is not voluntarily. You can't do, anytime you try to force somebody into discipleship, it won't work. The person must voluntarily yield his neck. Anytime somebody does not voluntarily yield his neck, you are, you are a mother. Leave him alone. He must voluntarily yield his neck under the yoke of the Lord Jesus. He is the one. It's not that Jesus will put yoke on you. You are the one that will put your neck under his yoke. I want you to see the difference. Jesus didn't put yoke on you. You are the one that carried your head and went and put it under his yoke. And say, oh God, I want my neck under your yoke because your yoke is easy and your burden is light. I want you to note discipleship is voluntary. Voluntary. You cannot remove the voluntariness in discipleship. It becomes tyranny. Anytime you remove the voluntariness in discipleship, what you are operating is a military style, uh, style tyranny. It's voluntary. Go ahead, my sister. voluntarily yields his neck under the yoke of the Lord Jesus Christ mm. so as to be taught and nurtured by him until he, the disciple, becomes like him. Mm. Matthew 11, 29 to 30. Mm. You will discover in that scripture that there are two kinds of rest the Bible talks about. Mm. The master says, come unto me and I will give you rest. Mm. Take my yoke upon you 
and you will find rest unto your soul. Any man who is under any labor or who is heavy laden, whether under the labor of sin, sickness, or demons, as soon as it comes unto the Lord Jesus, the normal thing that happens is for him to receive rest. That one is automatic as soon as you come unto Jesus for salvation. But then you will discover that that is not the end of that scripture. Healing and deliverance are not the end of what God wants to do in our lives. There is still another rest that the Lord promised us, but you can only find that rest as you fulfill the condition to take his yoke upon you and learn from him. That is discipleship. The Lord Jesus expects that if anybody has received rest from the Lord in terms of forgiveness of sins and rest from sickness and demons, the next thing he ought to do is to enroll voluntarily with the Lord Jesus Christ as a learner for discipleship training. It is not by force, by force, just as you voluntarily responded to Jesus' call in verse 28. You also need to deliberately and voluntarily respond to his call in verse 29. The call to take his yoke upon you and learn from him. When he said, come unto me, you came unto him without being forced. Then he says the next step is to take and learn from me. You need to respond likewise before you can find rest unto your soul. So a disciple is that person who has voluntarily yielded his neck under the yoke of the master and is prepared to learn from him. A yoke is a wooden bar put across the necks of two animals of the same kind to hold them together for the purpose of plowing. A yoke does not allow you to do what you like. It compels you to walk in the same step as the other yoke fellow. So when Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, it means enroll under my tutelage. Bind yourself to me so that where I go, there you will go also. What I allow is what you will eat. Anybody who has voluntarily and deliberately done that is a disciple. Okay, um, let's stop there for now and, and look again at some of the issues our brother was raising for us uh, from that uh, uh, matter. Uh, first, you see, you are noting, he's talking about, so when Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. So who is a disciple? A disciple is that person who has voluntarily and deliberately, you see those two words, these are very key words in discipleship. You can't be a disciple if it is not voluntary. You cannot be a disciple that grows well if you are not deliberate. A disciple is one who is as voluntary. He thought about it. You know, when you for you to be to volunteer. You think about it. You were given time to make your decision. You were given time to think about it, to come up with your decision, to think about it. And then you, 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 you weighed it, you weighed it. And then you voluntarily decided to take that decision. Then you must be deliberate. You see, after being voluntary, you must insist. You must deliberately insist that I am here to become like you. If a disciple is not deliberate in wanting to be like Jesus in everything, that disciple will not go far. He must be voluntary and deliberately done. That's who a disciple is. So a disciple is that person who has voluntarily yielded his neck under the yoke of the master and is prepared to learn of him. He has voluntarily 
You see that word, we keep using it, we keep using it. Voluntary. You, anytime you remove the word voluntary from discipleship, you have entered tyranny. You have entered something else. It's not discipleship. The DNA, the backbone of discipleship is voluntariness. It is when a man is voluntary that he has entered that yeah, he has entered what we really know as discipleship. Now you must come to that point. And for each one of us, God must bring us to that point. And then he began to describe and says, actually, for you to talk about a yoke, a yoke is a wooden bar put across the necks of two animals of the same kind. Note again that if those animals are not of the same kind, the lower animal will suffer. So if I go and put a yoke between an elephant and a cat, that cat will soon die. So for Jesus, so what, why, why is born again? Being born again is what brings me into the same nature like Jesus. That being born again allows me to have the nature like Jesus so that I'm of the same nature. I'm of the same stuff with him. Then he now puts that yoke on me and then we plow together. And now he said, a yoke does not allow you to do what you like. <laughs> you see, when a man is yoked, eh, he's tied. If uh, the other animal takes the right leg, you better take the right leg. That way, so this, the, the lightness of a yoke is dependent on your cooperation. A yoke can either be burdensome or light, depending on your obedience. If you obey the leader, if you obey the stronger uh, uh, animal, if the, the younger animal obeys the uh, stronger animal, the yoke will be light on him. If he disobeys and wants to do his own thing, his neck will soon break. So trust and obey. There is no other way to be happy, to have a light body if you don't trust him and you don't obey him. So if uh, the, the stronger animal is ready to begin to plow and the other animal say, no, me, I want to rest. And the other animal is dragging the younger animal. He will break his neck. Because it's a wooden beam. I know wood is different. It's not a material that is flexible. It's not like rubber. That if this one goes like this, this one will bend. Uh -uh. When wood is, is placed here, wood doesn't bend. So it is your neck that will bend. If you don't go in the direction of the wood, it will bend your neck. So that's why he was noting that it, it, is, it, is a, it is a wooden bar that is kept, you know, across both animals. It doesn't allow you to do what you want. It compels you to walk in step, in the same step as the other yoke fellow. So you can't just do what you like. If you are actually a yoked animal, you can't do what you like. And it is this freedom we want that makes many of us uh, not to want to continue in discipleship. I pray that God will bring you to this point that you are willing to yield your neck. Discipleship must be voluntary. You cannot grow in discipleship if you are not deliberate. Two keywords, voluntary, deliberate. Third one, if you are stubborn, your neck will break many times in discipleship. 
So when you hear some disciples say, oh, discipleship is not easy. Discipleship is tough. It's not easy. Uh -uh. It's because if you check, they are stubborn disciples. If a disciple takes the youth and is not struggling with the master, is moving at the pace of the master, is moving at the energy of the master, is moving in the direction of the master, such a disciple, with the yoke upon him will be light. He will fulfill what Matthew 11, verse 30 was saying, my yoke is easy and it is light on the condition that you cooperate, on the condition that you walk in step with me, on the condition that you walk in my direction, on the condition that you don't do what you like. When I'm ready to walk, you walk. When I say we should sit, you sit. As long as you follow me, that yoke will be easy, that yoke will be light. Praise the Lord. Yes, Sister Bimbola, go ahead. Yeah, um, thank you, sir, for the explanation. Mm. But um, there is this question that I would like to ask concerning yoking the same animals together. Mm. You know, because um, just like you explained, if one animal is stronger, you know, we are in the same class, but we are not in the same class. Now, if I go to yoke myself now, so I'm looking at um, the disciple and the human handler, the discipler now. So if I go to yoke myself with a discipler who is higher than me, for example, so I'm looking at this yoking the same animals together, and this discipler is faster than me. So we are seeing that the um, younger animal now definitely will get injured because if the, the higher discipler is running at his own pace and this younger discipler can't meet up you know, with this discipler, what you get to hear is you are the one that needs to um, keep up the pace. So now another depth of discipleship has come I mean, to me now concerning yoking the same animals that are of the same equal so that none of them get injured. So can you please elaborate more on that? Okay, we're not talking about the same strength. Um, there is a leading animal. There is a, there is a following animal. The animals, it will be a waste if you take two animals that are strong are at the same strength, then there will be no leader. So you don't use two animals of the same equal strength, no. You use two animals of the same species, two animals that are having the same, um, you know, you take, you don't use a dog and a sheep. If you are taking two sheep, you use two sheep. If you want to yoke two donkeys, you use two donkeys. You don't use a donkey and a sheep. They don't have the same characteristics and nature. So um, we're noting that the older animal, part of his being older is that he is aware that the younger animal the, the, of the same species does not have the same strength. So uh, how does it work? I want you to imagine that you are taking a stroll on the road with your two-year-old daughter. You are the mother. Your daughter is two years old. Do you walk at your pace or at your daughter's pace? A loving and under, a correct mother, if the mother is okay, is to walk at the pace of her daughter. And she carries the daughter along because she's teaching her aim is to teach the daughter to walk. He's to teach her how to walk on the road and not run across the road and not run in the place of the vehicle. So that mother walking with a child, with that daughter, is actually discipling the girl in knowing how not to cross road and not to cross the road when there are cars 
in knowing how to walk by the side of the road without walking on the road, you know, she, she, she's discipling her. And as they keep doing the work, you discover that that girl begins to grow until she becomes a teenager and then both of them can walk almost at the same pace. That's number one. Number two, I want you to know that in actually a walking, if we, what we hurt that two-year-old child is when she removes her hand from the mother and says, let me alone, I want to cross now. That's true. When the mother is walking with that daughter, she holds her hand. She holds her hand. But you see, they say practice makes perfect. Practice makes perfect. So that at the end of the day, uh, that daughter you have continually taken work with, she will learn to grow, increase her pace. So first, it is not and if they are, they are, they are, it's not you. It's somebody who is not higher than you can't disciple you. You can't disciple yourself. So you need someone who is mature, who knows it. So it's a it's a bigger animal who is more experienced, who the master has used before, and he knows how to dig. The, he's not that kind of animal that you put a yoke on him. Then he's playing on the field. No, this animal has been trained, and so he knows that we are doing ridges and he has to walk in a straight line. Now, when you yoke him with another animal, he now can teach the new animal how to, be, to move in a straight line. If you use two unserious, untested animals, your farm will be scattered because they don't yet have the discipline. So you need one who has acquired the discipline by discipleship to teach another one who is learning the discipline in discipleship. So yes, we are not of the same class, even though we are in the same class, but we yoke ourselves and we lovingly teach those who are growing to grow in the right direction. The aim of the work is not for the stronger animal to do what he likes is for the stronger animal to teach the younger animal to do what is right. And that yoke compels him to be business-like, to face the ridges that we are here to do and not behave anyhow. So you don't, if an animal is lazy, a good farmer does not go and use a lazy animal to yoke a new one. Uh -uh. It is that your best animal that you have discovered is very serious, very serious. It is that kind of animal you yoke to another animal and then it teaches him what to do. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Oh, our time is almost up. So is there any question? Any, um, does anyone have a question or a quick comment that we need to take uh, before we uh, just begin to tie it up again for us to pray? Um, okay, so let's let's uh, let me just uh, I can't see any hands, so let me try to uh, just make one or two quick points, and then we will then um, begin to round up for today. Uh, so uh, I'm noting again uh, there is still the the so he was talking to us about the two kinds of rest, and uh, that is this rest you have and you have it for your soul, uh, and the other rest you have is the rest you will have when you have yielded yourself uh, onto the yoke of the master. Now, I, I'm noting again, uh, it says, you need to respond likewise uh, before you can find rest onto your soul. So a disciple is that person who has voluntarily yielded his neck under the yoke of the master and is prepared. Yeah? That's another thing. That's the word deliberate I'm talking about. He is prepared, he is deliberate to learn. If you are, if you take the yoke and you don't learn, the yoke will be heavy. For that yoke to be light, you need to learn from the senior animal how he's doing it. For that yoke not to, there is a learning that makes the yoke easy. 
you must learn. And if you are that kind of person that will now decide to learn, you will discover that in learning, you make your yoke easy. Your yoke is made easy by learning. So you watch and you see learning is not just theoretical. Learning is both theoretical, is both practical. I'm seeing the way the, uh, this one takes is, you know, I, I don't know for those of us who did the NY, the National Youth Service in, in Nigeria, you remember when you are learning to march. Now they take some soldiers who are trained soldiers who know how to march. Then they take coppers like us who are inexperienced. Then we begin to see them. Then they stand in front, left, right, left, right. Now you begin to follow them. You begin to follow them. And as you are looking at them, you are hearing them, but we are looking at their legs. We are seeing how they are doing it. We are seeing how they are doing it. And then when they are doing slow march, they are doing quick march, we are watching them. It is as you do it that you now see some coppers who eventually at the end of the NYC uh, period begin to march like soldiers. They learn to march like soldiers. So God must bring us to that point that we must, you must, you, you learn by watching and by, by hearing. So you are learning as we're doing, you are also observing. That's why you cannot replace a human disciple. Brethren, if this discipleship will be quick and fast, you can replace a human disciple. So you can imagine we, we, that there were no soldiers. We just went to record, uh, we just went to record a uh, 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 quick march. Uh -huh. And we, we didn't see any visible example to show us how it is done. We will keep making mistakes. We will keep making mistakes. Ah, it's right. And we see how he turns his face. Aha. Quick like that, sharp. Aha. Then we say, hmm. Then we know we practice, we practice, we practice. Eventually, we do like them. And we become like them. And, and that discipline is there. When they are going for, for endurance strength, they go with you. They show you how to do it. That's how it's done. God keeps giving us these human disciples to continue to help us. I pray that the Lord uh, will help us even as we uh, bring ourselves again under the tutelage of this master. So a disciple uh, is one who enrolls. He enrolls under the tutelage uh, and he binds himself uh, wherever the master goes, I go. So that means that the disciple cannot have his own agenda. A disciple cannot have his own agenda. So when you hear someone say, I don't like that. I know that's not what I want. That's not when you are I, 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 then you cannot be a disciple. A disciple does not have his own agenda again. It is the master's agenda that becomes his agenda. If his yoke will be light, if his burden will be easy. He must actually yoke himself. He must enroll. He must, you know, learn, the, 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 he must, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, embrace the tutelage. He must bind himself to the master so that wherever the master goes, that's where he will go. What the master allow is what he will eat. A disciple doesn't do as he likes. So you see several people say, I'm a disciple of so, so, so person, but it is only what you want to do, you do. Your disciple is telling you, do like this. And you say, you will not do like that. You know, you are looking for trouble. And if he's a wise disciple, a disciple, he will not struggle with you because discipleship is voluntary. A wise disciple will not force you. It's voluntary. You are the one that will take it yourself. The Lord will help us as we go back again to begin to note that this yoke 
forces you not to do what you like. It forces you to do what only the master will want you to do. We are yoke fellows. You know, when Paul is talking about Timothy and Titus, he calls them yoke fellows. Yoke fellows. But you see, Timothy and Titus, they don't decide what they want to do. It is what Paul, where Paul says stay, they stay. When Paul says come, they come. When Paul says go, they go. They are yoke fellows, but they don't live for themselves. And that's how a disciple is. He says uh, to Titus, I, I left you at Crete. To Timothy, he says, I, I, I left you here to do this and do that. That's what I told you to do. And you see, as Timothy kept following, kept following, he became. May the Lord bring us to such a levels again of understanding in the name of the Lord Jesus. Okay. Uh, can I ask again at this point? Uh, let me ask uh, Sister Bola uh, Afolabi to pray for us and just help us tie these issues together in prayer as um, we also take note uh, our registration, I'm sorry, our attendance has been placed on the uh, our attendance has been placed on the chat. So if you go to the chat, you will see the attendance there, uh, which is placed already on the chat. Okay, so Sister Bola, can you uh, pray for us if you are still there? Uh, Bola Afolabi. Okay, I'm not sure she's there yet. Okay. Okay, so let me ask uh, Brother Lamide to pray for us. Brother Lamide, please go ahead. Thank you, sir. It's time for us to respond to the Lord concerning the issues that we have been confronted with today. Um, I'm thinking that it would be in order for us to just sit and reflect on the you know, sequence of these instructions today. And when the Lord began to speak, he began to first of all confront us, inundate us, if you like, with his glory his beauty, his magnanimity, his love, the fact that he is meek and lowly. We are, so the, the way he has presented himself to us, I just know that I have no reason to deny him access. I have no reason. You and I have no reason to keep postponing our complete and total submission. So I think first of all, can we just, can we just express our gladness in the fact that he saved us? Let's express our gratitude to him. He is the one who found you and he found me. Our brother quoted that scripture. He said, he that is forgiven much, loveth much. That was the case of that woman. That woman, you know, in the house of Simon the Tanner, when that woman was rubbing the feet of Jesus with her ear and crying and sobbing, and Simon was wondering, and Jesus told Simon, and those who were looking, all the Pharisees, he said, look, are you seeing how this woman is crying? And how this woman is expressing herself? How this woman is allowing her heart to overflow towards him? He said it's because she's forgiven much and because of that she loves much. Do you love him much? Do I love him much? I know that um, if I do not realize fully how much I have been forgiven, I will not love much. Brother, can we ponder on the gravity, the greatness of his forgiveness towards us? You know, sometimes some of us have a background that does not have so much of 
you know, bad experiences and the rest of that. And we then tend to think that, well, um, I'm not a sinner like others. And, you know, I understood that by my own experience. I knew that once you begin to think like that, you will never enter into the fullness of all that God has for you. I am equally a sinner as any other sinner upon the face of the earth. No matter the category of sins, the category of activities of sins that I committed before I knew the Lord, no matter how I rate it, I must understand that I am equally a sinner with every other sinner. That's why Paul said that he was the chief of sinners. Can we admit that before the Lord? That Lord, before you found me, I was the chief of sinners. And you found me, you forgave me much. Oh, let your heart overflow in thanksgiving towards the Lord. So that your heart can truly love him the way it ought to love him. You know, if we, you know, uh, connect this back to the story of Mary Magdalene, you saw that, oh, these women are just lovely women. They are showing us examples of what it means to truly love the Lord. Peter and John had been to the tomb. They entered and they have proof that Jesus had risen. They saw the napkin. They saw, you know, the, the linen garments and they quickly ran to show that they know that Jesus had risen. But no, Mary Magdalene stood there and she was weeping. She was weeping. She wanted to see the Lord. Can God do the same thing for you and me? That kind of passion for the Lord, that kind of, you know, pursuit of the Lord that does not allow me to, you know, to stop at any level, at a, a, a little level of revelation. That passion for the Lord that does not allow me to stop when I receive something little from heaven. When be, maybe heaven gives me a vision. Maybe heaven gives me an understanding. Maybe there is, you know, a light I receive. Lord, that I will not stop. There is the Lord I must see. These women have shown us that it is the Lord that we must see. Can we ask him? Lord, help me to press on to know you to know that I have been forgiven much and to love you. Lord, my heart must not be dry. I beg of you, help me. In the name of Jesus, last week we were learning that you know a new heart will be given to us and a new spirit. It will take away the heart of stone. And I was just thinking in myself that even when the Lord gives me that new heart, the heart of flesh, if I don't allow the water of the word of God to wash it, this heart of flesh will congeal again and become a stony heart again. I need a heart that will keep being washed by the water of the word. And I need a life, a, a, a kind of life where I can secretly, you know, have tears for the Lord. Lord, help me. As we round off this session of prayer, let's finally tell you. We can say that we have experienced the first rest, but that we experienced the second rest. Have we voluntarily yielded our neck to the yoke of discipleship? If we have voluntarily done that, are we deliberate in you know, pursuing the discipleship? the leading of the Lord over our lives. Can we respond to the Lord concerning that? Our brother said it so well, that when I enter into this second rest, that will now take me out of the multitude of believers who will always need to be going for deliverance, who always need to go for an healing meeting. Oh, there's a place for deliverance, there's a place for healing meeting, but when I enter that second rest, that rest for my soul, God takes me out of that category. Can we, can we respond to that and say, Lord, I want to take this yoke upon my life. I want to learn of you. Let's just thank him. Let's thank him for how he has helped us, how he has taught us. I, even from the way he's teaching us in this time, we see the gentility of the Lord, the meekness of the Lord. He is the Lord, yet he is humbling himself. What kind of thing is this? 
how can I not respond positively and properly to this? Lord, help me. Father, we thank you. In Jesus Christ's name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Brother Alamide, to continue to beg God. Um, again, we probably go back, study, and listen again, and beg God for our lives. And let's ask ourselves, am I bound? Are you free? Or you still find yourself being bound uh, by several things. Uh, so God must help us in Jesus' name. Okay, so let's uh, welcome those who are joining us for the first time. Yes, uh, is there anyone? Just lift up your hands the Zoom way. Okay, I can see uh, on the WhatsApp, uh, the, sorry, on the Telegram, there's Odu Fumilayo. Yes, and I can see Abiola Latunde on the Zoom. Olu Fumilayo, Olu Fumilola. Olu Fumilola, okay. So can we, uh, okay, I can see Ola Dina. Odun Lami is also joining us. So can you unmute and just uh, greet us quickly and tell us your name and where you are joining us from? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Odun Lami Oladino. I'm actually joining with my wife, Bola Juku Odun Lami. And um, we're calling from, we're tuning in from Lagos State. Okay. And um, thank you so much. Honestly, I've learned a lot today. And um, I'm going to actually sit down and meditate on everything I've learned today. Um, thank you very much. God bless you, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, uh, Sabiola, go ahead. <clears throat> uh, my name is Abiola Latunde. Um, I'm joining from the UK, and I just want to thank God for Sister Abimbola for inviting me, even on for letting me know about this. Um, and she, she very gracefully sent me the recordings for the last two meetings as well. So I was able to listen to the last two meetings, and I've been tremendously blessed. Thank you so very much for this platform. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Sister Abimbola. Uh, let's take. Um, Olufu Milayo from the Telegram. Um, okay, let me see if I can allow her. Okay, go ahead. So Olufu Milayo, you can unmute yourself and speak. Olufu Milayo, you can unmute yourself. I've unmuted you. Okay. Now, the, what's the trouble there now? Okay, can you go ahead? I've unmuted Ulufu Milayo. I've unmuted um, uh, Breeze. Hallelujah. Good morning. Okay. I've always seen the invite, uh, right? so I decided to also prepare this morning and I have been a Amen. Amen. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, the Lord bless you. And thank you for coming. So uh, for those of us who are joining for the first time, um, there is a, a attendance list on the Zoom. And I think um, there is also a link that takes you to the Telegram page where we usually send the recordings of the meeting. So if you are not on the Telegram page already, just uh, um, go there, you will see two links, one for attendance, the other for the Telegram page. 
just click on it. If you have Telegram on your phone, if you don't have Telegram on your phone, you have to first download Telegram on your phone and then click on the link. It takes you to the link. Uh, so that's where we send reminders and we send uh, information for the next meeting. Uh, those of us in Telegram, the Zoom link is also on the Telegram page. So you can always switch uh, whichever one is comfortable for you. Thank you all for coming. The Lord bless you. Uh, let's share the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the gift of the Holy Spirit, be with us now and forever. Amen. Surely, God's born of goodness and follow us in all the days of our lives. We shall in the house of the Lord forever and forever. God bless you. Thank you very much.